listening to the GM Shuffle with Michael Lombardi, presented by DraftKings and VSIN. Here is Femi Abebefe. Welcome to another edition of the GM Shuffle with Michael Lombardi, presented by DraftKings and VSIN. I'm your host, Femi Abebefe. As always, make sure to subscribe, rate, and review wherever you get your podcasts. Our producer, Elliot Bowman, with us on the ones and twos, or maybe on the twos and ones with his Colts now two and one this season after the shocking <laughs> upset against the Baltimore Ravens. We see you, Elliot, back there behind the glass. But we got to start, Michael. I mean, what a day it was in the National Football League. But we have to start with what we last saw, Sunday Night Football. Everyone is going crazy about the field goal decision Josh McDaniels made with 2.25 left to go in the fourth quarter. Raiders down eight against the Pittsburgh Steelers. They kicked the field goal. They never, well, they get the ball back, but with about 20 seconds left to go, Jimmy yeah. Garoppolo throwing the interception. But tough spot there for the Raiders as they fall to the Steelers 23 18 on Sunday night football. You know, I had an issue with the fourth and five call at the Pittsburgh 22 going for it there. There was. 13 18 to go in the game. If he kicks that field goal there, it's a 23 to 10 game. Uh, he went for it. I, I thought to me that that should be the conversation today. By going for the field goal late in the game, he gave himself a chance to win the game. Now, understanding that in game theory, his defense had to stop him. And mm -hmm. you, we know their defense isn't very good. They haven't forced a turnover in, in three weeks, they haven't really made a lot of plays on the football. So, to me, if you're arguing, this should he have gone, he shouldn't have. He's counted on something that perhaps was the wrong thing to count on, that he was going to get a stop. Yeah. And earlier in the quarter, you know, I felt like Josh should have kicked it there, made it 23 to 10, you know, because you got plenty of time. Because earlier in the day, and we'll get to this later, I mean, the Packers, the Packers did the same thing. What's fascinating about the Packer New Orleans game, the 18 points in the fourth quarter, besides Big Daddy's tweets with Texas to me, <laughs> Must have been which a were just <laughs> in, insane, it, uh, completely insane from the first from the first minute of the game. And then I don't hear from him the entire fourth quarter, like he disappeared. But anyway, you know, the Packers only had the ball for six minutes and change, less than six minutes in the fourth quarter and scored 18 points. And, you know, they got the two-point conversion. They made big plays. So, for me, if he kicks it there with 13, 18 to go, there's plenty of time. He's going to get – he got the ball back in three plays. Third and two, he throws it incomplete to Warren, gets it back. Now it's 13 to 10. Now it's going to be 23 to 18. Now you got a better chance, right? Now you're – you got a better chance at when you start that second drive after you get another stop. So, look, I, I, I think to me – Every time we analyze this, we analyze it as a standalone decision. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really wrong. And I think it's wrong. And I'm not defending the Raiders here because my son works for him. Look, I think the Raiders have got a lot to improve on. You know, Garoppolo leads the league in six interceptions, right? So what, what does that mean to us if you're scouting and you're an evaluator? It means that Garoppolo is struggling to feel comfortable within a new system. That's pretty clear, right? Everybody makes this connection between Garoppolo and Josh because he was in, in New England with them. But Garoppolo spent six years outside this system. And Garoppolo's used to doing things within the system that he's been doing for six years. So there's this changeover. Mm -hmm. It's just not he's putting on the same pair of pants every day. There's a changeover. It's resulting in a lot of mistakes. Six turnovers in, in, in three weeks. You can't beat anybody doing that. And so – a lot of this is going to come down to the coaches to decide, okay, Jimmy can do these five things really well. Maybe in our system, he doesn't do these two or three things and then figure out that. And they got to get Jacobs running the football better. I mean, that's going to be the key. They've got, they, they have to have balance in their attack. So that's their issues. But to me, you can't just look at this as a standalone. He should have, he shouldn't have, right? He counted on a false assumption. I grant you that. And I think that's the mistake he made. But I also think the mistake he made was in the fourth quarter, fourth and five at the Steeler 22, you know, go, you know, he overcame a, a, what I think it was a second and 34. Yep. It was second and 30, second and 34 at the 49 and they go 16 yards, you know, and then all of a sudden, you know, actually they gained too many yards. He should have just kicked the field goal. And if he kicks the field goal there, it's 23, 10. Now I'm not saying they're going to win the game because this was a classic example of a game where the Steelers were in control and in the league. The Steelers had control of this game, partly because the Raiders can't get a stop defensively. They can't make a play on a football. Did you count how many missed tackles there were in that game? Yeah. I mean, the first play of the game, the Steelers run the ball. looks like it's going to be a one-yard loss. It ends up being a five-yard game. 
it's, it's a lot of what it could have should. I mean, the Marcus Peters pick six that he could have walked into the end zone. And he just drops the ball right there. That was another what it could have should have for the Las Vegas Raiders. And I, I think we, I think we all pretty much agree like that field goal at the end with the two twenty five. It's like yeah, they probably should have gone for it there because I was actually okay with them kicking the initial field goal, the one that ended up they took off the board when the Steelers got called for the penalty with the unsportsmanlike when he pushed off on him because there was still enough time with three eleven left to go. It's like okay, you have all three of your timeouts. Like, I, obviously, you would have loved a touchdown, of course, but at least get something on the board. Try to get a stop because if you do get a stop in that spot, maybe there's a minute left or something like that to go ahead and try to take the lead. But with 225 left, it's like I think there were you were kind of boxed in. And like you said, he kind of made the false assumption that he could get the three and out to go ahead and get the ball back to ultimately take the lead, which was difficult for them there. But, uh, yeah, it's it was just a, one of those tough games for the Raiders where you're probably looking at yourself. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you weren't in control, but a lot of opportunity yeah, to be in control in that game. Well, I mean, you turn the ball over like they did. But he, here's what I think people also misunderstand a little bit, too. Again, I'm not defending it. To me, had they gone for it, it got it, got the two-point play, and then now the score is 23-23. Mm-hmm. The Steelers' mentality is going to be completely different in the next drive, yeah. right? It's aggressive. So it's going to be more aggressive. So when they come out to try to protect the ball, you've got a third and two. I mean, you know, they run the ball on first down, and, and Harris runs inside, and, you know, he gets five yards on first down. If you make that a third and 12, or a third and 10, but they, they can't do that. They're not good enough on defense. They don't have enough team speed on defense. I mean, look, they can't, no team can turn the ball over in six times. I mean, it's, it's the whole game theory of, you know, you can't, you can't risk this. You don't, you don't have enough margin of error to risk these things that you're doing. And a lot of it is because the guy's playing in a new system. I mean, you know, it, it, he does some incredibly good things, but he also doesn't, you know, the interception he throws in the third quarter over by the Steeler bench is, mm-hmm. I mean, that's, he, that lob, that was like, he just threw it up there. Like, had no reason to do that. Like, and I think, you know, one thing about Jimmy, you can coach Jimmy hard. Like Jimmy, you know, Jimmy's accountable. They got, they got to do that. I mean, they got to do it quickly because they understand, now they know what they are and what they're not, right? You know, they're going to be, they're going to hold on their asses on defense and, but they got to play less defense. And right now they haven't been able to play less defense. They're on the field too much because they can't run the ball. The Raiders can't control the ball. The Raiders have too many negative plays and they turn the ball over. Yeah. 19 rushing attempts, 69 yards for the Raiders, averaging 3.6 yards per carry with the running back last year who led the league in rushing. This was a really good running team a season ago, and they just can't get it going. And and maybe that part of that's a little bit of the competition. You have to give the Steelers some credit there with their front, but this has been a three-week thing now for the Raiders not being able to run the football. And uh, it's concerning for the Silver and Black, who now are 1-2 and two going to Los Angeles next week to take on the Chargers. Uh, speaking of those Chargers, talking about late game, yeah. late game decisions, boy, we, we talked about this game all week long, saying that there's a going to be some sort of craziness in this game you had the horseshoe on one end and you had the guru on the other end and it's just like this is it's it's the witching hour bowl and it was chargers beat the vikings 28 to 24 (laughs) i I wanted nothing to do with the game and i'm glad i had nothing to do with the game i mean russo took it russo took it on the friday show god bless him he came out on top maybe Uh the gummy that he took on saturday helped him but i mean like I, i this is exactly what the thought i was but look Here's where I really have an issue, and I, and I want all these analytical people to come after me on this, mm. okay? All right, because somebody posted up a tweet saying that if Staley went for it, 88%, he wins the game. If he mm. gets it, if he doesn't go for it, it's 82%. He made the right call. Okay, he made the right call. Your analytics, you come up, that's 6%, you got it. Okay, I'll give you that. All right, so let me give you feedback. This is where analytics is incomplete. Remember the scene in in uh, the Beautiful Mind where John Nash, uh, Russell Crowe, sitting there and he sees the girl and he says, "Adam Smith need revision. His game theory is incomplete." Right. Mm-hmm. Well, this analytical theory is incomplete. When that guy posted those numbers, they're incomplete because what he didn't post to it was the actual game. Okay, mm-hmm. what's going on in the game? All right. So let me give you a backdrop. I'm Brendan Staley, and I decide that I'm going to go for this, okay? Now, my man Justin Herbert threw seven incomplete passes the entire day. (laughs) Seven. Keenan Allen threw one. The Minnesota Vikings defensive backs touched the ball three times in the game, twice by Sean Murphy Bunning 
and once by another defensive back. They've touched it three times out of 47 passes. We only threw the ball seven incomplete times, okay? We ran the ball 14 times for 30 yards, all right? So we can't run the ball. We haven't been able to run the ball all day. So if you said to me, Staley decided to go for it, but he put the ball in Herbert's hands because analytically the numbers say, I'm going to get the first down. Just what I just cited to you. They're not going to touch the ball. I'm not going to get sacked. Even if they bring pressure, I've got an answer for it. But yet he runs a fullback belly to Josh Kelly for no gain. And now the analytical community says this guy's brilliant because he did the right thing. He looks at numbers, but he doesn't look at the game. It's incomplete. You have to watch the game. This is where analytics and just this is what you should do. Okay. Are you watching the game? Mm -hmm. Are you understanding the game? Do you get the game? See, you want to be critical of McDaniels because he wasn't watching the game because he was assuming his defense would get the ball back. Wrong assumption. Yep. Okay. Wrong assumption. That's part of the game theory. That's why analytics is incomplete when they just post numbers up there. That's why it's in because you're not counting into the game. And so if he throws a pass there, Femi, he's probably the clock's going to stop anyway. So yep. it's not like, oh, he's going to burn the time. The best thing he did to give Minnesota the chance, like if you would put up there, if he runs the ball, the number goes from 82%, it goes down to 43% based on the game. If he throws the ball, the number goes from 82% up to 95%. That's game theory. Yeah. And, and it's the simple question because everybody asks like, oh, like if you're the Vikings, what do you want them to do? Would you rather they go for it or punt it? It's more so if you're the Vikings, what do you want them to do? Would you rather they pass the ball or run the ball? The Vikings would have raised their hand and say, please run the football and give us a chance to stop you. Please run the ball in that spot. And they did that, stop that, them. That's why they're stupid. And then there's Chargers stupid. <laughs> But somehow they got the victory, though. And the Chargers being stupid as they were, somehow they got away with it. And we have to talk about that on the other side because the Vikings with the ball in the red zone, I don't know what in the world they were doing not being able to get a playoff after the fourth down conversion. I want to get your thoughts on that. Minnesota falling to 0-3. Now 0-3 in one score games after being 11-0 in one score games last year. The horseshoe seems to be missing in the Twin Cities. We'll break it all down. And, of course, a debacle in the desert. On the other side, this is the GM Shuffle. You're listening to the GM Shuffle with Michael Lombardi, presented by DraftKings and VSIN. Here is Femi Abebefe. So after the Chargers turned the ball over on downs, there was 146 on the clock. Vikings taking over at the 24-yard line. I and mean, when you talk about win probability percentages right there, it immediately shifts into Minnesota's favor, thinking that the Vikings have a yeah. good chance to go ahead and score a touchdown and ultimately win the game. Well, Minnesota had other ideas <laughs> up their sleeve there because Minnesota, with only down by four, needing a TD to score, they get to the point where they're facing a fourth and five with 41 seconds to go. And after converting that fourth and five, they don't snap the ball until about 19, 18 seconds left on the clock. What the hell went wrong with the Vikings and their late game execution? Uh, you know, listening to what Kevin O'Connell said after the game, he said they, they had a trouble with communication. They couldn't hear it, right? They couldn't hear themselves. The crowd was so euphoric about what was going on. And so they couldn't hear it. And so, you know, look, they get a delay of the game penalty, right? To, they get the drive in there. They got a first and 10 and Cousins throws incomplete to Osborne. Then the second down play, they run it. They lose a yard, right? They have no timeouts, but yeah. they ran the ball there. And then the third down call, third and 11, they get basically bailed out because Mike Davis illegal use of hands. So, and that, that gets them a timeout. Okay. And so that stops the clock. And then they got a first and 10, another delay of the game penalty. So they've had two delay of the game penalties, right? Yep. Two delay of the game penalties on the on the last drive of the game when they can't do it. I mean, they're giving away yards. I mean, it's their self-inflicted wounds. You can't do that. Like situationally, you can't have delay of the game. They're having a communication problem. You know, so there's there has to be some situation. Okay, here's the five plays we've got to run down here. And the fourth and five, they convert, and then they don't have enough time to get to the then they're screwed up when they get to the line, he throws an interception. Like they would have been better off spiking the ball and regrouping, just run the line and spike it, give up a play, mm -hmm. you know, and try to do that. But look, I mean, 
everybody's going to look at Staley winning the game and the Chargers winning the game. I mean, Staley's on a streak now. I just want you to know, Femi, Staley's on a fucking streak that that could rival the Maggio streak. It could rival the Maggio 56-game hit streak. He's on a streak of Al Davis wouldn't let him on the team plane mm-hmm. coming home. It started in Denver. That streak started in Denver when he played Mike Williams in a meaningless game. It continued in Jacksonville. There's no chance he'd have gotten on the plane at Jacksonville Airport. He would have had to fly Southwest back home. Okay. Mm-hmm. There's no chance. All right. Then opening game, you know, against Miami, letting JC Jackson cover uh, Hill or letting any other corner cover Tyreek Hill man to man, like thinking that was no chance. The, his office door would have been locked the next day. That's three in a row. Four at the Tennessee game, the two minute drill. That's five. This game's th- th- four. That's four. Then this game would have, he's on a five game. I can't get back on the plane. Like, I don't know what more the guy has to do. You know, I don't know. Like, don't tell me like they're, you're, you're, Here's what drives me crazy. They tell me he's using game theory. They tell me he's using all these things, right? Mm-hmm. The defense still, still, after last year, still can't stop the run. I mean, they, they gave up 5.4 yards per carry yesterday. Mm-hmm. 5.4. I mean, Minnesota's sitting there kicking themselves in the air. They probably didn't run the ball enough. I mean, Jefferson has seven catches for 150 yards, and he's the guy you want to stop going into the game. Yeah, we'll just treat Justin Jefferson like any other old receiver. That's 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 what we'll do. I mean, he's he's on an idiot parlay. That, that's what the streak is. It's an idiot parlay that somehow he keeps surviving. I don't know how thing. people can justify him. I really don't. Like, I, yeah. I'm getting to the point where, like, I am I I am with your guy in Chicago. I'm done talking about it. Mm-hmm. Like, at some point, you get to the point where either either you, you as Parcells would say, quit kicking the dog. He's already dead. Like, if you can't recognize it, there's no. I can't talk you into it. It's a, just a, I just can't, you don't see it. We're watching a different game. You're making excuses. It's incomplete. It's just ridiculous. But what this guy does, he doesn't do defense. Look, he, and you know, and I know he's got to play the Raiders this week. Maybe mm-hmm. they'll shut the Raiders out. I'm sure he, you know, whatever. Mm-hmm. But the reality of it is, is you've got to gate, you're evaluating what that's going on here. And the mistakes that are made in game with, with the talent that they have is, is pretty impressive. And the big injury news from that game, and before we go to the game between the Cowboys and the Cardinals, is that Mike Williams, they fear that this could be a season-ending knee injury. So we're talking about their best pass catcher, their biggest playmaker on the outside, potentially out for a long period of time, if not the entire season. So kind of keep that in mind about this Chargers team going forward here. Uh, they get the victory, but obviously a, a big loss with Mike Williams uh, down and to they, injury. I think they injury. lost Derwin James, too. I think Derwin yeah. James got he, hurt in this yeah, game, Yeah, he got a hamstring inj- uh, injury for Derwin James. So we'll have to keep an eye how on that this how about minnesota we talked about their fortunes had a change Mm -hmm. they've had the ball they've turned the ball six times in the red zone they've had seven fumbles already this year the raiders six interceptions minnesota's fumbled the ball seven times they've turned it over six times in the red zone already this year they've turned it over four times inside the 10 right i mean think about that i mean and, and this game they were they they were the beneficiaries in this game they got seven first downs in this game by penalty Seven. Couldn't pull it out. Seven. Re- regression is a wicked witch. <laughs> and regression has come to kill the Minnesota Vikings in 2023. Uh, how about my team yesterday, which was just an absolute disaster? They lose to the Cardinals 28 to 16 as an 11 point favorite. I believe this is the biggest upset of the season thus far here. The Cardinals' offense, 400 total yards against this vaunted Cowboys defense, uh, 7.5 yards per flavor for Arizona, 17 to 21 for Josh Dobbs, 189 yards, a touchdown. Arizona able to run the football. James Conner with 98 yards on 14 carries, also had a touchdown as well as Dallas, falls to 2-1, and one, losing to the Cardinals. Well, I mean, look, the Cowboys have allowed points in the first five drives, 23 points at the start of the game. Mm-hmm. I mean, you, you know, you can't, you, you can't do that. They, had a, they actually had a play from behind. But, you know, this game really comes down to two areas, right? It comes down to their inability to execute in the red zone, yep. the Cowboys. And the 13 penalties for 107 yards. I mean, that's what it comes down to. Now, the Cowboys, in fairness, were missing three offensive linemen. Your boy Smith, you know, he was supposed to go. I see him on the sideline. <laughs> yeah, that I mean, was... that's just a – I mean, that happens all the time. Like, yeah. you, you, he's always hurt. It, like, he's always hurt. That It's just it's just a problem, you it's, know, and it's, it's not going to – it's unfortunate because they need him, but but they know that. I mean, you have to know when you sign up for him, he's going to be hurt. Like, it's just – it's no doubt. But, you know, look, when you give up 7.4 yards to a bad football team and your opposing quarterback only throws four incomplete passes, 
You know, hey, look, one thing you knew going into the game that that Arizona was going to play hard. Yeah, they're going to play hard, and they did, and they didn't turn the ball over. They didn't turn the ball over, and that's what win the game. Meanwhile, you know, you beat yourself. You know, Arizona doesn't turn the ball. No fumbles. They're able to execute on third down. They were 60% on third down. They averaged seven, five a play, you know, and, and really the game comes down to the penalties and the Cowboys are one for five in the red zone. Yep. Five I mean, Cowboys only, the Cowboys only had eight possessions in the game. Think about this, Femi. They had eight possessions and they were, and they were in the red zone five times. Five red zone trips and only get six points from those red zone trips. Like, that's just atrocious. And the penalties, I mean, this goes back to the 2021 Cowboys when they, I mean, the, we all know the amount of penalties in the, the wild card game against the 49ers. That one was egregious. <laughs> Bless you. 13 penalties, 107 yards. You, like, I, I don't care who you're playing. You're, you're going to put yourself behind the eight ball doing that against any NFL team. And then the red zone stuff like you mentioned there. But it was really just disappointing defensively. Like, they, they just looked like they just had no idea what was coming with this Cardinals running game. Cardinals credit to Drew Petzig, the offensive coordinator of Arizona. They found something there schematically where they were able to take advantage of Dallas's defense, but it was a flat-out egg from the defense, and by the time they actually got to playing well, you're already behind having given up 23 points, and it was just a disaster performance, so uh, it's unfortunate. I'm not really, like, like, it's not freak out mode. This is the NFL. They weren't. They were never going to go seventeen and zero. But to lose this game, it's just like, all right. Well, let's see how you bounce back because you have a tough game coming up on Sunday against New England, who has a pretty tough front and also is really well coached. So uh, you, you can't afford to drop the two and two. That's for damn sure. But the Cowboys lose twenty eight to sixteen. We have three and a half minutes left here in this segment, Michael. But I got to. We got to talk about the Miami Dolphins. Is there a team in the NFL having more fun than the Miami <laughs> Dolphins? They beat the Broncos 70 to 20. Like I had to quadruple check to make sure I wasn't seeing things because I had shut it off after halftime with my Broncos plus six and a half bet in the contest. But 70 to 20, two of 309, four TDs, Tyreek Hill, 157, nine catches, a touchdown. They averaged 10 yards per play, a first down every play. I have never seen anything like this in an NFL game. I'm not sure you could go against there and achieve these numbers. <laughs> they had they had 10 drives in the game. Okay. They had 10 drives in the game. They had 10 touchdowns in the game. Okay. Eight came on six plays or less. Five came on three plays or less. The Denver defensive backs never touched the ball. Never touched Insane. the ball. Now I know they were missing Justin Simmons. I was on Denver too. I didn't know Simmons was going to be out. That wouldn't have changed my mind. I thought Sean Payton would have done a better job of managing the game. Like, where is the adjustment? Why are we playing? I mean, we they, they had guys open. I mean, yeah. it, it, it was embarrassing. I mean, the week before, New England holds them to 24 points. In this game, you give up 70? 70. Like, at some point, you got to stop the bleeding. Like, I, I, I mean, I don't know, like, this, it's so bad, you just can't blame Vance Joseph, although he's going to take Man. a lot of the heat on this. He has to. He has to. Right? Like, why can't we just play cover three and just keep the ball in front of us and, and at least let him eat the clock up? Like, you can't give up 10 points. I mean, they gave up 350 yards rushing. Three. They were only in third down. They had. T- they, they scored 10 times. To- they only in third down nine times. They only got nine times in third down. Like, at some point, when do you stop the bleeding? It was like, what? Yeah. No, it's a, mean, go ahead. And look, they're good. They're good. But I mean, the week before they scored 24 points. Like, I mean, Tua, Tua took him what, nine minutes in the third quarter before he throws first, first incompletion. And then Mike White came in. I mean, look, say what you want. Mike White comes in. He's two for two for 67 yards. He's lighting Mike it up. Mike White actually had it. Yeah. I mean, Mike White actually lit it up. <laughs> It's it's laughable what what Denver was doing defensively in the last game. I felt like I was watching a college football game. Like you know when you get those top five teams against a directional school early on yeah. in September. Like that's what it looked like in, in an NFL game. And, and this is the most yards, Michael, because this was history. The most yards since 1951 when the Rams had 735 yards against the Yanks. That was Norm Van Brocklin's Rams in that game. Most points in an NFL game since 1966. The most points ever was the Bears 73 in 1940. Washington had seven. 72 in 1966, the Dolphins 70 in 2023. And they even they called the dogs up. They could have kicked the field goal at the end of the game there to get to the 73. But Mike McDaniel had a little bit of mercy in him and just said, we're going to go ahead and, and, and kneel this thing out. Six for six in the red zone. Like, I don't think he goes six for six in the red zone against air. <laughs> like, against air. Six for six. I mean, the Broncos were down there four times. They were one for four. 
looked like a walkthrough. Is what it looked like. It was. <laughs> it was a walkthrough. 726 yards of offense. That's more offense than the Titans have had the entire season with 721. Put that into perspective. We'll continue to break down yesterday's slate. This is the GM Shuffle presented by DraftKings and Visa. You're listening to the GM Shuffle with Michael Lombardi, presented by DraftKings and VSIN. Here is Femi Abebefe. Well, let's go to the Meadowlands here, where it was a wet and rainy game out there. The The wind was kicking up. The temperatures were not very great, but the Patriots get the victory. First one of the season, 15-10 to 10 over the New York Jets, now extending their win streak over the JETS Jets to 15. Teen. New England gets a much needed win and the Jets fall to one and two and boy uh, behind center it does not look good for JETS man but what were your thoughts watching that game yesterday afternoon I know you had a close eye on this one well I mean look the, the Jets quarterbacking situation is atrocious yeah. and and as much as I said and wrote about it that they have to go with Wilson they got to make Wilson better I think we've come to the point where Wilson can't play like we've come to that point with to me I've come to that point with Justin Fields You've come to that point with Zach, Zach Wilson. At some point, there's no save in this guy. Uh, he he can't process. He's got no rhythm to his game. Does he have a great arm? Maybe if you give him a chance. But there's really no situation that that he effectively can win you a game. And to me, what's happening, and you saw it on the sidelines yesterday, is Salah can defend him, but at some point, the team doesn't buy it. The team's just not going to buy it. And the way that New England played them yesterday is the recipe for the rest of the season. And what we thought was the strength of the Jets, which is their defense, is far from being their strength. I mean, the last two weeks, they've given up 134 and 157 yards rushing. I mean, you go into that game, it's raining, it's it's windy, it's it's kind of like, okay, we know New England's coming here to run the football, and you give up 157 yards rushing, okay? And you know that, you know, and they're lucky the score was 15 to 10. I mean, it should have been worse. New England had some some blurbs of their own. I mean, they they kind of made some mistakes in the game to kind of make it a lot closer than it should be. Don't convert a third. They got Ro- Romando Stevenson's wide open in the first quarter. Yeah, hits him in the numbers. He probably going to run down the sideline for a touchdown. So uh, the Jets defense is completely overrated. Let's put that out there. Like the Patriots finally got their offensive line together and they blocked. The Jets defense is 21st in the league in third down conversions allowed. And like last year, they haven't forced a turnover, Femi, because people play them conservatively because they know there's no way their offense could muster 15, 18 points. There's just no way. Unless you turn it over and give them the ball in field goal range, they're not going to be able to score any points. So, you know, I know Joe Douglas got an A in every single draft he's ever participated in. Going back to the 46 draft, the very first draft, <laughs> like the he got an A in that draft too. He got an A in every draft. He's 21 and 48 as the general manager. God bless him. 21 and 48 as a GM. I mean, you know, I got one year really in the league. A lot of guys don't get this opportunity. 21 and 48, and everybody talks about how talented they are. Okay, they're talented. But are you, we sure they're really good? I mean, they put Beckton over at left tackle. That was a disaster. Mm-hmm. Patriots kicked his ass all day, right? The right tackle's not any good, you know? And so they, they, they had to move out the, their best lineman, Tucker, out to right tackle. That's not fair. They put Tippin in at right guard. I mean, and, and the Patriots are down every Jones in their secondary. Jack, uh, Jonathan. Marcus. And, and Marcus. Yeah. Every Jones is out in the secondary. And yet they covered them with, with Bryant, with Miles Bryant and Sean Wade off the bench. And, you know, I mean, look, and this game shouldn't have been. I mean, here it is. It's, it, you got a chance. This is situational football. And New England gave them to open the door. I mean, when they get that sack in the end zone, they punt away. And Miles Bryant, for some reason, decides he doesn't fair catch it. He's going to return it. If he fair catches it, he's going to get the ball to 25. He catches it, they had the ball to 15. And then, and then this is where, this is my issue with Mac Jones, and people think I'm unfair. All right? So third and three, got to get the first down. Third and three, got to get the first down. Right? It, it, on the last drive, let me get it right here. On the last drive of the game, we got a, a third and, uh, all right, they get the ball back with 219 to go in the game. 
and they mm-hmm. have a third and three. And and he throws it to Smith Schuster. No, let's go back a little bit. They get the ball with 524 to go in the game. They're up 13 to 10. All right. They come yep. out to get a first down. All right. Now they got a third and six. Third and six. And he throws it down the field out of bounds to J- Smith Schuster. Like you can't make why are we throwing the ball there? Like, what are we doing? We got just gonna get the first down. All right. You overcome that to get the safety. Then on third and three, he throws a disastrous pass over to the sideline. I don't know where that was going. You got a chance to come win the game there. And then, you know, those two plays in situational football, I mean, they gave the Jets an opportunity to get back in it, but the Jets are so inept at quarterback, they can't do anything. I, I mean, they have to make a change, Femi. You can't go down this. You're going to lose the team. Yeah, I mean, it feels like deja vu because like, we had this conversation on the podcast last year after they played the New England Patriots, for that matter. When Zach Wilson said that, when they asked him, hey, do you feel bad about the offense not being able to score any points in the game where Marcus Jones had the game-winning punt return touchdown? And then that's what kind of prompted him being benched for Mike White. And after the game, Robert Sala was asked, he was like, hey, why do you have so much confidence in Zach Wilson? And he said, quote, he's who gives us the best chance to win. But before he said that, he kind of like almost said, he's our best like, I think he wanted to say that he's our best guy in the QB room, but then he just said he's who gives us the best chance to win. It was a weird answer from Robert Sala, not like a, a full-on vote of confidence, one that would kind of lead you to believe that maybe the Jets go down this path of replacing Zach Wilson because, like you mentioned, like losing the locker room and losing the rest of the guys, like it feels like that's sort of happened already. That's why they went out and, and did all they could do to get Aaron Rodgers. Unfortunately, Rodgers tearing his Achilles opening night has now brought us right back to square one. But it's 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 tough. I, I remember I was watching. I didn't watch a ton of the broadcast, but I, I tuned in for the fourth quarter because the game started to get close. And <laughs> my guy Tony Romo, he he was trying to coach up Zach Wilson from the booth. Man. He was like, "Take the check down, take take the check." I was like, "I've never heard this on a broadcast." Seeing one of the, one of the color guys coaching up the quarterback, but that's kind of where we're at right now with Zach Wilson, unfortunately, with the Jets. Well, there has to be another solution. I mean, the the it's you fired Mike Mike Lafleur. Because he was the problem. You bring in Nathaniel Hackett. You've got all these great skill players. You spent. You're the number. You're the highest. You, you have the most money in the team of any anybody, mm-hmm. and yet you can't. You, you're just all going away now. You know the defense has to assume some liability in this too. But also, but the offense. I mean, that offensive line is bad. I mean, Becton. Becton. You talk about two bad picks. I mean, everybody blows it with quarterbacks. I get that. But mm-hmm. Becton over Worfs is going to be the one that, that Douglas is going to regret because Becton's not a, I mean, Becton looks terrible at left and right. He just doesn't look good enough to be able to play out there. And people, and he, he, this week they got the chiefs coming into town. <laughs> the chiefs defense is as good as any defense in the league with their front. Who's blocking, who's going to block Chris Jones. It's only going to go worse. I mean, it's not getting any better. And, and if you don't, and if you don't do something, it, it's going to be a real problem. Yeah, and the Becton one is really disappointing too because his his rookie year there was the signs of oh my gosh this guy's dominant in the run game he can be this kind of cornerstone tackle but it's just been downhill from hill from here and the injuries have played a part but also it's like hey you're on the field you're healthy you gotta get, you gotta play better and he How just about, hasn't been put able to your play. handicap hat on for me and then we gotta run off to another game mm-hmm. but the, uh, the, n- this week they have the Chiefs at home next week they go to Denver what do you think that line would be when they play Denver Oh my gosh. I mean, Denver's favored. I mean, it's you got to be Denver at least three because I don't think Zach Wilson can be less than three on the road if he's the quarterback. So <laughs> you're you're looking at Broncos, despite how awful they've been all season, three, maybe three and a half. Denver the favorite. <laughs> I mean, the Jets have run for the Jets since really. Other than if you take out the long run by Bryce Hall, and, and I think how, how long was that run that Bryce Hall had the uh, long run. Uh, no, who had? Yeah, he had the long run, right? I mean, yeah, he had the least, long yeah. run. It was yeah. eighty-three yards. Okay, you take eighty-three yards out of that run, that one run. So they had against basically Buffalo. they had yeah. against Buffalo. They have one hundred and seventy-two minus eighty-three, sixty-four and thirty-eight. They can't run the ball. I mean, unless they make a big run, which they did, eighty-three. I mean, they've under they they can't get to one hundred yards rushing, and this guy's never thrown over one hundred and fifty yards. So forget about that. And the fact is, look, this game, they didn't even turn the ball over, and they still lost. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they, they have to be absolutely perfect on defense, which we already said, they're not that kind of defense that can be perfect. So thus, you're now one and two, and 
<laughs> you're welcome in Kansas City on Sunday Night Football. I'm sure that's going to go really well. Uh, how about in Lambeau Field? You hinted at this. You said Big Daddy stopped texting you. Oh, my God. Where is my phone? Where is my phone? <laughs> yeah, you got to get so your phone. Good. Because I, I, oh, my when, when, when Rashid Shahid had the punt return touchdown, I was just like, I was all I could think about was Big Daddy. I'm like, I'm sure Big Daddy is just absolutely losing his mind. Packers down 17 nothing. I'm sure it's here we go again. LaFleur is trying to be a cheerleader and all that stuff. And then the fourth quarter happens. And then Green Bay goes on to score 18 unanswered. Now, obviously, a big thing in the, in the game was Derek Hart, Derek Hart having the shoulder injury. We'll get into all that. But I just want you to, to let us know on the big daddy text messages. 112. 112. <laughs> so this stupid, is 12 minutes stupid, into the game. <laughs> yeah, when they went for it on fourth fourth down, stupid, stupid play by LaFuck. Fourth and two. Really nice, you know, really nice call. LaFuck and, and Barry, what a coaching staff. Now, this is in the first quarter, right? Uh, uh, I said, it's only the first quarter, big daddy. I know. We're real good at adjusting. Good luck. This is embarrassing. And here's this. We've drafted defensive backs high in the draft for, what, 10-plus years? And now we have a seventh-round pick, Valentine, covering all of oh, Okay, that's really going to work out. You know, I've been preaching to you for years about Green Bay's piss-poor high draft picks. Must have been DBs. All DBs. Stokes is a bust. Alexander's always hurt. Now, now, then he goes into the obvious, you know, losing to the Saints at home, no points in the first half, trick plays for two yards, a complete joke. Then he then he sends me something from a beat writer, this guy, Zach Cruz, who's praising LaFleur for his play calling. And this is during the game. Beat writer in Green Bay. This guy's delusional. Love doesn't look off anybody. At 4.07, I send him a text saying, you've gone quiet. <laughs> <laughs> big, we gotta love Big Daddy. <laughs> His team might win the division. He's ready to fire I everyone. I mean, I mean, look at the in the fourth quarter. I mean, this is why I think you got to take points. What they did in the fourth quarter was remarkable. Now, mm. I understand Carr got hurt. Yes, you know, and I know that New Orleans missed that field goal down the stretch. But I mean, you know, the Packers had 14 first downs in the fourth. They had seven for the first three parts of the game. They only had the ball for 653 in the fourth. Mm-hmm. You know. And so basically, you know, and the Saints had every chance to make plays. They got their hands on 15 passes. It's one of the untold stats people don't look at. How many passes are defended? That Because they lead to interceptions. They got their hands on 15 balls yesterday, only had one pick. Yeah, yeah it was a hell of a fourth quarter for Green Bay. And also kudos to Green Bay for doing the shrewd move of going for two when they were down eight after scoring the touchdown to then make it a six-point game because if they got the ball back, then they could go ahead and get a touchdown to win the game, which ultimately is what happened going up 18-17. Uh, but Big Daddy, never change. Absolutely never change. We'll get him Thursday Night Football, Lions-Packers this week. I'm sure that'll be a lot of fun with the country watching. We'll get to the rest of the games on the other side. You're listening to the GM Shuffle with Michael Lombardi, presented by DraftKings and VSIN. Here is Femi Abebefe. All right, we got to go rapid fire here, Michael, because we got to get to our awards and have time to break down the two Monday night football games as well. But uh, how about the Indianapolis Colts? Seven and a half point underdogs winning outright against the Baltimore mm. Ravens, 22 to 19. Now, a lot of people will point to the no call uh, that was against Zay Flowers there that looked like defensive pass interference. I thought it was DPI, but the Ravens felt like they had bigger problems in this game than, than a no call there, losing this one at home after a couple good weeks there going out to 2 and 0. Yeah, I, I mean, look, it, you, every game we could show it. I mean, there is it goes different ways. You don't know how they're going to call it. Look, uh, Baltimore, it, you know, they played as well as you could play for missing as many guys as they were missing. I mean, the Colts kicker made four kicks over 53 yards in yeah. a bad weather day. I mean, that's pretty amazing, right? And the Colts played a clean game. They didn't play a great game, but they played a clean game. And, you know, they met, the, the one that they really missed was Minshew stepped out of bounds for a safety, and they didn't mm-hmm. call that. Did you see that? Pulled a Danny O. Yeah. He pulled a Danny O. I mean, he misses, he misses that. You know, they're just – they were the, – the Colts were average 3-9 a play. They had 22 third downs. It was kind of like death by a 1,000 paper cuts in this game. Give them credit. They played well. You know, the Ravens r- ran out of linemen. They ran, you know, they didn't have enough guys, and they battle like they always do, and they found a way. I mean, look. Tucker, what, misses that kick by a half a yard, probably? Mm -hmm. I mean, this was a hard game for Baltimore. I was so surprised this line didn't move further down because of so many injuries that Baltimore had. 
they, they overcame the injuries last week. They couldn't do it again this week here. Uh, I just want, real quick, last thing on this game. When Tucker missed that field goal, I mean, I was stunned. Like, like, like whenever the guy misses, it's almost like it's a blue yeah. moon because you just feel like he's always going to make every single kick. Like, like, I was just like, my jaw was open. I was like, oh, my God, <laughs> Justin Tucker missed the field goal. But granted, it was a 61-yard field goal on grass in bad weather game. So I guess it shouldn't be the expectation that it would make it. But massive win for the Colts. We'll talk more about the Colts and some of these other first-year head coaches on Thursday because I think there's a larger discussion that we should have. But let's keep it moving here with some other games. The Cleveland Browns. Whew. How about that defense? They beat the Titans 27-3. Tennessee had 94 yards of offense, could absolutely do nothing, 2.1 yards per play. Miles Garrett, three and a half sacks. And and also Deshaun Watson, quietly enough, put together his best game by far as a Cleveland Brown. I I wrote that in my notes, best game by far. I mean, look, we knew the Browns weren't going to be able to run the ball in Tennessee, but he had to play well, and he did. I thought this was one of my plays I gave out. Mm-hmm. I, I thought this was a really – I took it on Russo uh, because I thought it was the line should have been more. But the, the, the Titans have no offensive line, you know, right now, and they have no real passing game. Again, we talked about it on the show. I, I, I'm not sure – uh, you know, I'm not sure that Hopkins can run 4-9. I'm really not, yeah. you know, and who's going to make a play? Of course, they made a 70-yarder against the Chargers and a 49-yarder with more against the Chargers. But – Schwartz isn't going to let them do that. I mean, they did a great job in this game. And, you know, the Titans had six first downs. That's all they had. The Browns had 23. They averaged 7.3 yards per play to 2.3. There's a mismatch. I mean, the Titans are in for a long year because they have no offense. They can't. There's nothing. There's no explosiveness. And when you stop the running game like they did, 15 carries for 26 yards. Titans, are, it's checkmate. Tannehill's not good enough to make yeah. plays. Yeah, a complete mismatch with that Browns front on the, the defensive side against the Titans offensive line. That was just a, a nightmare scenario. And our producer, Elliot Bowman, put this nugget in here for the Cleveland defense. He said they've allowed only one offensive touchdown through the first three games. They've also allowed an NFL low 3.2 yards per play this season, best by any NFL defense through three games since 2000. Their per play dominance has helped Cleveland force three and outs on 61.5% of opposition's drives, also best by any defense through three games since 2000. We, we could be talking about an all a, you hate to throw around all time, but so far the early signs of this Jim Schwartz Cleveland Browns defense, they're the best defense in the league until we see it otherwise. Like, like they're just yeah. they're that good. Now and they, they didn't have Newsom in the game. They missed one of their yeah. corners in the game. I mean, look, you one thing about Schwartz, I said it all summer. You don't run the ball on him. It's hard. His run fits are as good as any run fits in the league. He, they're well coached, they're disciplined, they just don't fly up the field. He coaches the D-line and the front seven to fit on the run. It isn't just a gap control, oh, oh I miss my gap. It's really orchestrated. And so it's detailed, and so it's got the elements, so it's hard to stop the run. They're good up front. Then he mismatches He mismatches uh, Garrett on whoever. So he knows they're trying to double Garrett, so he mm-hmm. moves Garrett all over the place. And so it's hilarious. They're trying to watch play. You know, you're watching, he's shifting. And, and, and Tennessee's trying to do it. But the key to this game was Schwartz was in Tennessee last year. He was spent the whole year with them. He knows their system better than anybody. And, and so that gave them a huge advantage. And not only from a talent standpoint, from a scheme standpoint. Look, if Watson plays to this level, and I don't know if he can continue, you know, I, I, I think that, that they, they're going to be formidable. There's no question. They got Baltimore coming in. Mm-hmm. Now, they should beat Baltimore. Baltimore's secondary. It depends on Baltimore's injury list. But Baltimore's offense will have a hard time moving the football if they don't get their linemen back. Yeah, especially yeah, if Linderbaum and Stanley are not playing in that game. Oh, good luck, Lamar. <laughs> you got to get those wheels going. And uh, to quote your buddy, the the Bear, Chris Felica, he always has this this saying called "lay it and laugh." That was Cle- betting Cleveland yesterday. You just lay the points and then you laugh at the end. It's just like, hey, that that was a lot of fun. I enjoyed that. I wish all the bets went that way. Uh, For as right as I was on Cleveland, I was really wrong on Denver. So I'm not <laughs> patting myself on the back. Okay, hey, hey, I'm, I, not, I, I'm not one of those people that put out my wins on Twitter. I'm not doing that. Hey. I love those people here. My they're wins, fun. yeah. They're, they're, those, but you those never the see ones. their losses. Yeah, you know. <laughs> I, I, tw- I tweeted about one of my losses. The 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 Commanders plus six and a half. I was like, you know what? That's how I want to lose. No chance. No heartbreak. We just move on to the next game. <laughs> just just remind you to never bet on Ron Rivera. Don't get carried away. That yeah. game was a mismatch, and, and and poor Sam Howell got sacked nine times in that Getting game. Killed. Never there. had a chance. Three interceptions. I mean, look. Here's another thing that's overrated is this Washington defense. And I was on them last year. I thought Mm -hmm. they would play better. But the last two weeks against the Denver offense and against the Buffalo offense, even the Raiders moved the football effectively on them. The Raiders just didn't have any possessions. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, it, it was bad from the Washington Commander defense that is uh, has a lot of first round pick capital invested in that defensive line. And Josh Allen was doing whatever he wanted. Diggs was doing whatever he wanted in that game. Bills winning at thirty seven three. Last one before we get to the awards here. The the Lions they beat the Falcons twenty to six. Another one where I laid it. I wasn't laughing because I was devising scenarios to where Lions would not cover this game, but they ultimately cover and win this game. Yeah. Uh, Falcons fall to 2-1 and one here. And, uh, yeah, it could be another uh, quarterback situation that's uh, less than ideal for the Dirty Birds. Well, I mean, look, it, it, this was a tough matchup. We talked about it on the show on Sunday. The Falcons have – if the Falcons can't run the ball, they can't win. Yeah. Right? We know this, right? So they can't run it. And it, one thing about Detroit's front, they're good. I mean, Detroit could stop the run. Now, where you got to get Detroit, you got to throw the football. But they can't throw the football. You know, and so when they average 2.2 a carry and you put them in 14 third downs, right, it's mm-hmm. hard. You know, they average 2.8 for the game. I mean, they're fortunate they got four first downs by penalty. So it's a mismatch. And to me, you handicapped that game. Everybody was – there was a lot of money coming in on Atlanta. There was. For some reason, people thought Atlanta was a good play. But that matchup didn't favor Atlanta because if Atlanta couldn't run it on the road, right, first time they played on the road, it was going to be a challenge. And so. I think to me, look, Detroit and and the tight end for Detroit, Laporta, Laporta, oh, he's I, I love great. Him. Leads I the love league him. in that. You know, the other thing I think too is there's the kid at uh, at Buffalo, the the linebacker at Buffalo, Bernard, Terrell Bernard, the kid from from Baylor. Another great game yesterday. He's an undersized linebacker. He looks like a safety, but defensive rookie of the year. This guy's on track to get it. Trust me, mm. he's playing well. Yeah, well, we'll see one of the candidates later on tonight. And Jalen Carter, we'll get to that game in just a bit. But let's get to our awards. The Fred Palermo best game plan of the week. Well, you got to give it to Houston, right? I mean, Houston and and you got to give it to Houston and Arizona. I mean, this is two weeks in a row. Arizona has been in the game and give Gannon and and Drew Petzik and Mm -hmm. that whole staff. Those guys play hard. I mean, and the Texans, I mean, can you imagine getting beat by a fullback returning a goddamn (laughs) kickoff for you? I mean, is that embarrassing or what? Best play of the entire day. (laughs) I mean, that's about, and not only that, I mean, the special teams of Jacksonville killed you. Block field goal, yeah. you know, you miss a field goal, and then you give up that return. And look, C.J. Stroud right now is playing as the best of any rookie. He's uh-huh. throwing the football effectively. His accuracy is improving with each and every week. You know, he's really – see, this is this is what I, 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 I kind of wrote down in my notes. That, and again, I don't want to touch on this subject because I'm done with it. I've beaten it up to death. But, you know, look, C.J. Stroud in three games has thrown for over 200 yards passing in a win. Your guy, your guy's pest passing game in a win was 209 yards. And he's out of 22 games, 22 games out of 30, he's been under 200 yards. Okay? So either you have it or you don't. It, this nonsense of, well, I just need better players around him. We need a better scheme. We need that. No, bullshit. Like, bullshit. Like, Stroud's missing linemen. He's missing receivers. He does that to Jacksonville, who was a playoff team. Like, enough. Brock Purdy, you know, 10 starts in his career, over 280 yards twice. Like that, we, we do this. We basically make excuses when there shouldn't be any because players that are good prove they don't need excuses. To your point on Stroud. I'm done. I'm done. Uh, I'm, just, I'm just talking about C.J. Stroud. Uh, first player in NFL history to have at least 900 passing yards, four passing touchdowns, and zero interceptions in his first three career starts. And get this quote from their tight end, Brevin Jordan, before we get to the rest of the awards. He said, quote, the best thing that happened to the Houston Texans franchise was us beating the Indianapolis Colts last game last year. We drafted the right guy. He's unbelievable. That is yeah. some strong words there from their tight end, Brevin Jordan. Let's get to the rest of your awards, though. Who's going on the lamb? Well, I mean, you got to put Denver's defense on the lamb for and Denver's organization on the lamb. I mean, Sean yeah. Payton's embarrassed. I mean, you know, he that that he's brought in there to fix the problem. And I I mean Chicago. I, I listened to Eber Flus's press conference afterwards. He was accountable. Chicago's not a good team. I, I've said it all year. They're not a good team. They're not good enough on defense. They're not a good team. But they they're they're on the lamb big time. They got they got Denver coming to town. So we got the lamb bowl. <laughs> the lamb bowl should be fun. Uh fraud of the week. Washington's defense and the Jets defense, like they're supposed to be the strength of their team. You know, Washington's offensive line has been a disaster. I've said it all summer, right? So nine sacks is ridiculous, but their defense has got to play better. And same with the Jets. If the Jets have any chance to win a game, their defense has to play better. If you don't know, now you know. Talent doesn't need other players scheme to win. They can shine alone. Stop making excuses. And then it is what it is. 
Zach Wilson's a blown pick. Joe, just admit it. Move on. It's time. It's time. I know you'll get an A for that draft. It doesn't matter. You already got it, Joe. Just move on. It is what it is. It's what it is, Joe. He, he got Sauce and Garrett Wilson in, in, one, in the These draft. These are the higher-ups, so. Joe. These are the higher-ups. Uh, who do you like tonight? We get the uh, the Eagles at the Bucks and then the Rams at the Bengals. I think the Eagles will play well tonight. I like the Eagles. Everybody's taking the Bucks in the point. Yeah. That line move. I love the Eagles and the Rams. I like the two road teams. Today. All right. I went with the two dogs. I do have Bucks plus six and a half from last Monday. Then I have Rams plus six and a half from last Monday as oh, well. Do- I love you double we'll, dipping. There we'll, it is. We'll, we'll, we'll see how it Femi. goes. <laughs> two game Femi, double dip Femi, Twitter Femi. You got it all. It's going to be a lot tonight. That does it for us. We'll see you guys on Thursday.